Hello and welcome to my talk. Uh, I'm Daniel Brockman. I work on Cilium itself and also on the Linux kernel. So I co-maintain eBPF in the Linux kernel. And today's talk is about 100 gigabit per second clusters with Cilium building tomorrow's networking data plane. So when looking at uh, data center networks, what are the, the large challenges? And essentially, uh, I think you can put them into three big pillars. Uh, scale, performance, and operations, probably all of them would deserve like a talk on its own. So scale, scaling out into many nodes, many parts, performance, making the best use of the resources and operations, um, making changes to your clusters frequently without disruptions, for example. So my question is, what if IPv6 could address both scale and performance requirements from those three pillars? So that's what I'm going to elaborate in this talk. Uh, before going and looking into more into the future, I actually want to take a step back and look into 2016 because then we actually first announced the Cilium experiment. You know, we started out with IPv6 only container networking uh, together with eBPF and XTP. For those of you who don't know what eBPF is, it's um, kernel technology that uh, makes, makes the kernel programmable, customizable in a safe way. Uh, so yeah, so this is how we started out. Uh, IPv6 only networking, scalable, flexible global addressing, you don't need NAT. Um, so we tried to abstract away uh, from traditional networking models, only focusing on, on layer three and, and, and above. And we built all of Cilium uh, on top of eVPF for, the, for maximum efficiency. So until, you know, we were really excited about IPv6 because the way how we can implement the data plane with that, until of course reality kicked in and back in 2016, the state of IPv6 and uh, in Kubernetes and Docker in particular wasn't quite there yet. So yeah, we had to basically go back and implement <laughs> IPv4 support up on popular demand, which probably a lot of people are, are running Cilium with. Um, so yeah, fast forward 2020, uh, how does the situation look like today? Uh, Kubernetes has adopted IPv6 single stack for quite a while and uh, dual stack also. And the hyperscale has also made progress integrating IPv6 into the environment, often most of it rather dual stack. Uh, so if you look at, for example, the managed Kubernetes offerings, AKS, EKS, GKE, they all offer you know, various level of IPv6 support. Um, most of them dual stack, there's one single stack. So, but th that's already great. Um, in terms of IPv6, like why do, want to, why do users want to go there? And a lot of times we hear they want to have more IPAM flexibility, so they don't want to run out of uh, IP addresses um, and have enough headroom uh, through IPv6, in particular when they have large clusters with lots of churn. Uh, so in general, there was a, actually it was a really interesting uh, dual stack adoption panel at the last KubeCon, I can recommend watching that. In general, it's, um, right now it's regarded as a, as a transitional state. So of course, in the future, looking further out, we want to go to IPv6 end-to-end -to -end in general in order to avoid the complexity of having both, you know, of having both IPv4 and IPv6 in your cluster. Um, so the typical approach that we've seen users uh, Today, they are trying to build out, you know, islands of IPv6 single stack on-prem clusters, you know, as a clean slate, and then trying to successfully uh, move applications and services into their cluster. Um, yeah, so then you go and deploy an IPv6, uh, yeah, an IPv6 only cluster, so no IPv4, but then, then you face again reality and you will have to interface somehow with IPv4. So that's unless you're air-gapped or you're, you know, you're really lucky with dependencies. And if you look at the Alexa 1000 sites, um, it's a bit of a sad state because, you know, like roughly half of the sites support IPv6 and the other ones not. So it's, it's really not quite there yet. Um, you will hit a, a couple of ecosystem bumps on the road. For example, uh, when, when looking at that, I saw that GitHub, which is very frequently used by developers, not IPv6 ready yet, but there is support in, in terms of supporting that. So there's work in progress. And yeah, so in a modern v6 only environment, uh, how do you deal with IPv4? So you will have to uh, run somehow NAT4.6 or 6.4, so in order to translate between the two worlds. Uh, so looking at NAT4.6 and 
Um, with Linux, it's actually not possible, so there's no such thing in NetFilter, uh, because simply the Linux kernel uh, is really complicated, and it has a lot of uh, protocol information in the packet itself. Uh, but we added uh, support for this in eBPF, so eBPF environment is a bit more um, is a bit more constrained, so there, you know, it's 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 less complex uh, to be able to do that there. And uh, so now, yeah. So how is this, now the question is, how do you ingress v4? Like, if you have a v4 client somewhere on the internet and you want to connect to your v6 only cluster, how do you approach that? So the first option is to use uh, Solium with a stateful NAT46 gateway. And the way this typically looks. So on the left side, you see the an external node making DNS request, you get back the A record with the IPv4 address, then this issues the SYN packet. You have to go through a dual stack component. So that will be like your NAT46 gateway, uh, which will map the IPv4 address and port to some IPv6 address and port. And then you can go into your IPv6 uh, single stack Kubernetes cluster. And there you maybe have a Kubernetes load balancer service with that uh, front end IPv6 address, and then you can talk to it. And that, that front-end address will have backends that you can manage, right? <clears throat> so, yeah, so basically that uh, six to four, like four to six gateway is sitting at the, you know, at the edge of the cluster, and it's the only uh, dual stack component. Um, and we map essentially from VIP to VIP, like from a VIP, IPv4 VIP to an IPv6 VIP and port. Uh, so, and the only thing that is exposed from the Kubernetes cluster itself is the IPv6 that would be accessible without going to this extra hop to the v4 gateway. So this has a couple of upsides. Um, so the IPv4 VIP and port is uh, completely decoupled from your Kubernetes uh, cluster and, and from your Kubernetes uh, service. Uh, you don't need a special load balancer service. You don't have special IPAM requirements for the load balancer, and any public IP, IPv6 prefix works as as is. Um, you can even do like uh, with with the load balance, like you can even load balance through multiple Kubernetes clusters, uh, for example, through weighted maglev and so on. So that's possible. Uh, there are a bit of there are also downsides to that. So you need to have like an control plane in order to push down like the IPv4 to IPv6 mappings. And the other one is the original source IP preservation when the traffic hits the Kubernetes cluster is lost because you have to do the NAT. Um, it's stateful, so it needs to do DNAT and SNAT, but you know, thanks to eBPF and you can push it into the XTP layer, like into the driver layer, you can actually achieve high packet rates nevertheless, so like tens of millions of packets per second. Um, option two that is on the table would be to have like a stateless NAT 4 to 6 gateway. And the way this works basically is quite similar, but here you only do the translation on the layer three. So there's like a special prefix uh, when you translate to, to the V6, and then you need to have this, uh, like a load balancer service with the special prefix um, in your Kubernetes cluster as well to then load balance to the backends. And then uh, you have the advantage to not have state. So this is really highly scalable uh, because you don't hold state on the node, on the, on the gateway node. Um, it allows for source address preservation because you know, the original client source address is essentially encoded into the IPv6 address. And you can use things like load balancer source ranges to also filter for that for external IPv4 clients and no control plane is needed because the translation works essentially transparent. Uh, but the downside is, of course, you need to have like, an, like a local balancer IPAM, which uh, understands this prefix and essentially have, has like a, a public IPv4 uh, accessible address in there. And yeah, so you need to have this awareness. So essentially when the when the cluster replies back to the client, this of course has to be then again routable in the internet. So this needs to have some, some public v4 address that is then encoded in the v6. So now like let's bring in one more layer of difficulty. So this was maybe like more of this, like the more straightforward part, four to six into the cluster. The other layer of difficulty is like when you go to IPv6, you have an IPv6 only cluster and it wants to talk to IPv4. So here, DNS 624 plays a key part in, the, in, in that. 
for example, when you, like going back to the previous example, when you want when you want to do a DNS lookup for, for, for GitHub, you get the IPv4 address, but when you try a quad A record, uh, it, it, it doesn't answer, so how do you talk to it? There's a, a six, like DNS 6.4 proxy. Uh, for example, here's a public Google one, uh, and it will return you an address where, is, where essentially it has a IPv6 specific prefix, and the remaining bits is the encoded IPv4 address in there. So this is the way how it will look. So now you have on the left side your Kubernetes cluster, on the right side uh, the internet, and if your node wants to talk to the internet, you, go, you have to go through this proxy. The proxy will make an actual A request uh, through DNS uh, to the internet. It will receive a reply, and it will then encode this reply in a quad A record back to your cluster. And now your, your nodes in the cluster can do a SYN request uh, to, to this address. This has to go through the NAT 624 gateway. It will then do the translation, and it will then go back to IPv4 and hit the actual external nodes. So, yeah, so this, uh, um, oh, okay, yeah, so, sorry. So, yeah, yeah, Core DNS, for example, supports this kind of functionality um, if you want to use this in your, in your environment. So the upside is, again, like if you have a stateless translation, this is, again, highly scalable, doesn't hold state on the node, and all the traffic in the cluster can be pure v6 only. So the nodes, pods, even the gateway IP, so there's no dealing with IPv4. Uh, the downside here is that the IPAM management becomes more complex because the pods know they would have to have like a secondary uh, IP address which, which has the specific uh, prefix, like the not for well-known prefix in there in order to reply back. Um, so in order to overcome this, uh, this uh, limitation, one, that one thing that can be addressed, uh, that can address this, is essentially to do the stateful translation on the way out. So you, the pods reply with their primary address, hit the gateway node, do the translation there, and then uh, talk, to the, talk back to the IPv4 client. So I have a short demo for the, for the 4 to 6, 6 to 4 gateway. Uh, given the wireless was quite bad in here, I did some pre-recording uh, the other day. Um, so I'm, I'm just walking you through that. So here you have an um, IPv6 reachable uh, web uh, server, and it has an IPv6 address. It can only be reached there. And now if you go into the gateway node itself, so this is running Cilium as a standalone, you will see now that it has an IPv4 uh, service prefix, and the backend itself is the actual, you know, like the, the web browser. And you can see you hit, the, you hit curl on the IPv4 address and you get to the IPv6 in here. So that's the one case, the one situation. And now the other, the other way around, the NAT624 uh, is quite similar. So you have an IPv4 uh, reachable address and it does not, it, it cannot be reached through IPv6. Now you go to the standalone gateway node, you have an IPv6 front end address. Uh, in Cilium in here, and this is all done through eBPF at the XDP layer. Uh, so if you do the curl, it will do it will reach the IPv4 uh, page. So, yeah. Um, okay, so now we have bootstrapped our IPv6 cluster, and it can talk to IPv4. So, like, what's next? So, as I said, so IPv6 does not only address the scaling concerns, but also future performance requirements. So, enter Cilium with Big TCP. So, Big TCP is a technology that got merged uh, into recent kernels in, in 5.19. It has been developed by, by Google, and the goal uh, from, from Google's side, but also, you know, for the broader community is to support future data center workloads for, you know, single sockets where you go 100 gigabit per second, 200, 400, and beyond. So that is the aim for that. And you would say, why care? Well, if you have a big data workloads, AI, machine learning, or other really network intensive workloads that have bulk transfers, so it's really useful for that. But even if you don't have it, it will free up you know, your application resources so that you can use that instead of the kernel stack and you have to spend cycles there. Um, if you look at 100 gigabit per second, it's really constrained. So if you think about uh, 1,500 MTU, um, you would, it would only have 123 nanoseconds per packet, and you would have to be able to process 8 point, uh, around 8.15 million packets per second. So that itself is quite unrealistic for the kernel stack, so you really need batching. 
and the kernel has batching. Uh, it's called GRO and TSO, so generic receive of load uh, and uh, at, um, transmit segmentation of load. Um, if you look at how the like at the way how the kernel receives and transmits packets today, so for example, packets going into the application, you have the network card, uh, you have eBPF layer, and then there's something like GRO, and and this this really tries to aggregate many packets. So what you can see here, many MTU size packets are coming in, and it tries to aggregate this into a single super size packet up to 64k, and it will push it up to the stack so that you have to traverse the stack only once instead of multiple times. And the same way also works on the way out. So the kernel stack typically tries to aggregate a large packet, and then um, on, the, on your hardware NIC, it will typically, like most of the NIC support this today, it will then uh, chunk them up into, individu into individual packets. There's also GSO, like that's the software um, equivalent for that. So yeah, so once you like like once the NIC chunks them up into packets, usually they are received as a train of packets, like for TCP streams, um, and then the GRO will will pull it back together. So there's not too much latency where GRO would have to wait. Um, but there's an upper size limitation. So the 64K is really the upper size limitation that we have today. Um, the reason is that the the well the this the the, the packet size is encoded in the IP header's total length, and that is 16-bit, and therefore it's limited to 64K. In the same way, of course, on the way down. Uh, so can we make bigger batches? So here, IPv6 is to the rescue. So big TCP basically overcomes the 16-bit limit um, with just a small kernel change. So it will insert a hop-by-hop -hop IPv6 extension header. And... This is just local to the node because uh, the GRO aggregation, it's, it's, you, you don't have to make any changes on, on your network, on the wire, or you don't have to change MTUs. Uh, so the way this looks is basically, it's like the IPv6 header, it will have a length of zero. And then in the hop by hop letter, um, in the hop by hop extension header, it will have a Jumbo uh, extension there. And there's like a payload length field for 32 bits. So you can theoretically go to four gigabit per <laughs> As a, as, as a packet size, which is, of course, unrealistic today, at least, but uh, um, that's the theoretical limitation. And with that, you can actually bump the, the aggregation size for GAO uh, and also TSO, like for the way in and for the way out. Right now, the kernel uh, has set this to 512K, uh, but this can be raised in the future. But, you know, IPv4 is stuck essentially with 64K limit. And we implemented support for this feature in Cilium 113 that is, you know, released um, approximately uh, like towards the end of the year. Uh, so there's just a single knob and then um, all your pods uh, will going to use it. So Cilium will essentially uh, set this uh, like fu functionality for all the pods, for all the devices and the host. And then, um, yeah, and, and the maybe less obvious part is this will also help for request response type workloads. So we did some latency measurements in our lab and what we, what we found is like on the, on the last bar here, if you run Cilium with, uh, with big TCP disabled, which is basically just a you know, stock Cilium, um, and if you then enable it, you will see like a, or at least we've seen in our tests, a 2.2x lower P99 latency, which is uh, quite good. And it also helps like for the transactions, uh, like we have so, like request response transactions, and it improved them by 32%. And looking at the bulk TCP streams, uh, so the default when you run, for example, iperf in your network from uh, pod to pod, uh, when, it, when it was off, we were able to reach in, in our test systems uh, 52 gigabit per second. So, the, so those test systems, they are just like, like in, in our lab, they are like game, gaming systems, but with 100 gigabit NICs uh, because they had PCI Express 4. Um, and then if you turned it on, we just got, uh, so, so we got a plus 8 gigabit per second performance improvement, so we were able to get to 60 gigabit per second. And then if you look at what else would be missing, so if you look in, in, into actually the, the trace profile, uh, you see like a lot of copy to and from user, that's a limitation because iperf does not yet use memory map TCP, so there's a good net dev talk. Uh, from the Google TCP maintainers into, you know, memory map TCP and how you can even go beyond that. So that's essentially now the limitation here. 
So yeah, so more broadly, uh, big TCP is one piece of the picture. Um, if I look at uh, Solium with tomorrow's data plane in mind, so how can we get to a high-scale opinionated data plane? And if I look at Solium as a standalone gateway, so we, we achieve this through eBPF on the XDP layer to a layer for load balancing, which has a programmable API. It supports MarkLev, DSR, graceful backend termination, and then the new things with the Net4.6 and 6.4 gateway so that you can build V6 only clusters. And then the other side, so Cilium inside Kubernetes as a networking platform. So there are like a bunch of uh, pieces of the puzzle to get it really to high scale. So one of the things is the eBPF based Q proxy replacement, which uses also XTP and a socket load balancer in the kernel. Then we have a feature which is called eBPF based host routing for lowering the latency. I will go into that a bit. Uh, we have a bandwidth manager. I gave a talk about this at the last KubeCon if you're interested. So this essentially allows, this essentially installs FQ QDiscs on your physical devices and this allows to do pacing. This enables BBR for ports, uh, which would otherwise not be possible. And you can do bandwidth limitation, which uh, with the lower latency than the usual means. And then the new pieces that we added uh, now in the new uh, Solium release is IPv6 big TCP support. And last but not least, a new meta driver as a weave device replacement. So I will go into that as the last part of the talk. So what is a meta device? And in order to explain you the rationale, how we got there, uh, I, want to sh I want to first show like the typical data path, how it looks in the kernel. So typically you go to the upper stack for packets in and out of the pod. Um, you have to go to IP routing, uh, net filter, and so on. And we added an extension a while back into the kernel where from BPF we can uh, directly push traffic into the pod just in one go. So without having to traverse the per CPU backlog uh, queues in the kernel for weave devices. So that really helps to deliver latencies. You can wake up the application right away without having to go to a rescheduling point. On the way out, we added the helper to push traffic into the neighboring subsystem so it can do a L2 resolution. So you don't have to go through the upper stack. And uh, so that's basically the eBPF host routing feature and it uh, really helps with the performance. And now the new component is basically a weave device replacement. Um, and that essentially, uh, helps to be like, like the, the goal of that is essentially to have eBPF programs as part of the, as part of the device inside the pod. Um, of course, without the pod being able to unload it or change it in any way, because you don't want to do that. You want to control it from the host namespace, from Cilium, for example. And the, the whole idea is to shift the Cilium BPF programs from the you know, TC layer, like the TC BPF layer where we had this originally, into device itself. And this helps reduce the latency even further. Um, so if you look at the flame graphs for the, for the kernel, so this is the typical weave case. Uh, so what you can see is like weave, uh, you know, clears some of the metadata. It pushes it into a per CPU backlog queue also on the way out. And then uh, in the really, in the worst case, like the kernel soft IQ daemon issues another thread. So you have this like rescheduling point. So basically the, like the call graph goes here, then it does an NQ, and then it has to pick up the packet again to then process it. And with the new device type that we built um, in tailored for Cilium, you just do everything in one go. You don't have this additional queuing, you don't have this, this rescheduling. And that really helps to reduce uh, latency. So our main goal with, like with the eBPF host routing, this was all the way for, the, for packets going into the pod. And now with this device, this, this uh, will basically solve it for packets going out of the pod. So this in combination, uh, the goal that we had in, in mind with that is basically to reduce the latency um, and to increase the performance uh, in the same way as the application would run inside the host namespace. And if you look at the latency here, you can see I, like in the yellow line is, is essentially the latency for applications running in the host. And uh, it's essentially the same. Same with the transaction is, uh, rate. Like if you have more like request response type workloads, they will also be on par with the host and uh, throughput as well. So yeah, that will basically solve it. So essentially the pieces of the puzzle like for a high scale data plane that I 
talked about um, that are really critical in, in, in this scenario is like the eBPF-based Kube proxy replacement, the bandwidth manager that I covered uh, at the KubeCon uh, in, in April, uh, the eBPF host routing, the new IPv6 big TCP support in the meta devices. So when you then run Cilium, you will get all of that. Yeah, last but not least, I want to thank a couple of folks in the, in the Linux kernel community, BPF and uh, Kubernetes community, um, also those who from, from Google who created uh, initially the, the big TCP support in the kernel, because I think it's a really exciting feature which has a lot of potential. And um, as you can see, it's, it's maybe not like an obvious thing when you move to IPv6, what other benefit you will get from that. So yeah, uh, with that, I would like to thank you and uh, open up for questions. <laughs> All right. So if you have multiple clusters, yeah, then you would have to have such a gateway in front of your IPv6 only cluster, right? So they would have to talk to each other. So you would have to talk through the through that VIP if you expose it as a service. Yeah, I mean, you would have to make that gateway aware of this, yeah. Okay. Yeah? You showed um, pod to pod increase with this new meta device, right? Yeah. Um, you compared it against, like, the standard B travel. Yeah. Have you compared it against just socket redirection, like um, BPS socket redirection for pod to pod on the same node? Like, what's the... So, well, I mean, this is still like um, behind network namespaces, right? So you would have to get out of the network namespace in the first place. You cannot just cross this barrier um, or like break this barrier in that sense. Okay. I, I kind of got you, but like you can still do socket direction from pod to pod on a host. I mean, this will also work for, for a pod to pod. So it, 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 will, it will also like di directly go into the device inside the pod without having to go to this backlog queue. Yeah? When you use your new driver, can you share the, the physical uh, interface with multiple pods? Or is it yeah, of course. No, it, 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 it's not tied to, yeah, I mean, this is definitely shared. It, it, it's a virtual device in that sense, which overcomes the limitations that the, that the Weave device has. All right. Um, oh, one thing I, I forgot to mention. While I was actually preparing the talk, I noticed that there's actual progress. Uh, so this will, GitHub will have V6 support. So this is really great. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so if you have uh, more questions, um, please either come to the Solium booth or, or ask me directly or, you know, yeah, thanks. <laughs>